want to challenge them this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. My name is Lauren. Uh, I am, believe it or not, the other pastor. I'm like, you know, the guy that talks about his wife and you never see her. And you go, she, is she married? I mean, make this stuff up. No, I'm the other pastor. Uh, usually I'm out there in a uh, workshop during this hour. And uh, we have a great time studying the Word of God out there as well. And a little more smaller context, a little more dialogue, discussion, uh, conversation. But uh, this morning, it's my privilege to be sharing with you from the book of Ephesians. And I want to just kind of give you a little bit of background, okay, before we jump into this. The book of Ephesians was written to a, a bunch of people that were just like us, okay? Um, if you look through, and I'm just going to read off some verses here. You don't have to turn to all of them, but I just want you to understand. Verse 1 tells us that they were faithful saints. Just like you folks sitting here today, they were followers of Jesus. Verse 2 and other verses in Ephesians say that they were sons and daughters of the Father. That they were forgiven, they were welcomed home by God in Christ. Ephesians tells us they were still suffering though, even though they were his children. Verse 14, they were suffering because of the crafty schemes of the enemy Chapter 2, verse 19, they were suffering because they were being judged by other Jewish people. Uh, they had relational struggles. And chapter 4 talks about struggles within the body of Christ. Chapter 5, struggles within the family. Chapter 6, struggle, struggles at work. Like they did all the things that we do. It tells us as well, they were battling the same temptations to sin as we do. As we get started this morning, I want to read to you, uh, this is, okay, fictional, all right, so this doesn't come from the Word of God, I'm, I'm making this up, but I want to read for you uh, maybe a letter that could have been written to Paul, a, a letter from one of, these, one of these faithful saints, one of these sons, one of these people who are still struggling with sin, one of these people who are still suffering. And it might go something like this. Hey, Paul, I'm, a, I'm a, a little bit confused. I'm not confused about my salvation. I know I trusted in Christ for my salvation. But I'm confused about life. I'm confused about my life, and I'm confused about the lives of people around me. I look around, and I see sinners who are saints. They're still struggling with sin over and over and over again. The reality is their relationships are a mess, just like people who don't know God. Their homes can be sometimes cold and harsh. They handle suffering in a little bit different way, but not much than unsaved people do. They just want to get rid of it. I look around and I see Christians who have no idea who they are in Christ. They swing from self-hatred. I can't stand what I do. I can't stand who I am. I can't stand my life. To self-sufficiency. I'm, I'm the greatest. Look at me. I'm, I'm the best thing that's come to this world. So Paul, what is the gospel sufficient for? Is it only for heaven? Is it only for eternity? For one day when I get there? If grace is so sufficient, why do I so see so many Christians who struggle with ineffectual lives and relationships? But Paul, here's where I really get confused. It seems like some feel the church does not have any wisdom for real life. The world sure claims it does. Every time I turn around, I hear about a new answer. I hear about a new approach to life. I hear about how to make sense of my messed up life. One group claims that they have a special truth. If I just add their secret sauce to my life, if I just get their knowledge, then I can enjoy my life. One group says, I have to work harder. I just have to try harder, be better. Another group comes with all these emotions and relationships and regulations and I just 
I'm struggling. While all of them contradict each other, they seem to have one common message. They seem to be saying Christianity isn't enough. Do I need to mix Christ's wisdom with theirs? They're telling me I can keep my Christianity, but add their little secrets. They're telling me I can keep my Christianity, but add their new way of thinking or their new way of living. I can just keep my Christianity, but plug something else in. So Paul, is Christianity all I need or what? If Christ is sufficient, do I really need more? If the gospel is sufficient, not only for eternal life, but for daily life now, then why does not, doesn't it seem sufficient? I know you're busy, Paul, but if you've got time to reply, I'd appreciate it. Have you ever wrestled with any of those questions? Ever wrestled with, man, this group of people that comes together every Sunday, we don't look a whole lot different than the group of people that doesn't. And yet God's word says we have enough. We're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 1 today. And I want to set this up by kind of helping you to understand we're, we're dividing our first section into three different stanzas because this is kind of supposed to be like a hymn or a statement of faith. So I'm going to read real quick the introduction that Paul gives. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's his introduction to his letter. And then Paul goes into this hymn, okay? Stanza number one, and you're going to see highlighted in, in yellow or orange or whatever color that is. If you're colorblind, you're doesn't matter what color it is. Hopefully it's not white to you. But these are the kind of the phrases that define our little stanzas of this song, okay, this hymn. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to, for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. That stanza number one. Stanza number two. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. In all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will so that we who are the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. Stanza number three. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. I hope you see in all of this, there is one main theme. This is not about you. This is not about PCBC. This is about him. We're going to talk some more about that because over the last several weeks, Steve's been talking about being grounded in the word and growing in worship. That's kind of the what of our lives, isn't it? We want our lives to be grounded in the Word of God. We want our lives to be growing in worship. Today, I want to talk about the why behind that. Because if we just get in our minds, okay, i got to study the Bible. i got to spend more time in prayer. i got to serve people. i got to do all these things, but we miss the why. It's not going to be long until you're back to doing what you always did before. You're going to be frustrated. You're going to feel guilty. 
And so this is the why behind everything that we do. It is to the praise of his glory. So let's go back to verse 3, and we're going to begin to look at each particular stanza and try and understand what, why is it divided into these three sections. We're going to go through a lot of material today. My point isn't to get real deep this morning. It's just to present truth to kind of help us to apply it. And then if you want to go further, there's the, the uh, sermon supplement. You can take it and you can, you can continue to study it a little bit more. But I want you to see, first of all, stanza number one is centered around God the Father. The Bible never explicitly uses the term Trinity. But you're going to see in these three stanzas, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, they are all there. And this first stanza is trying to explain to us God's heart in this idea of salvation. But how does God participate in that? He sends us Christ. It says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now before we get too far, I just want to talk about that word blessed because we've talked about it in our workshops when I throw out, hey, what's the word blessed mean? We all know it means happy because we think beatitudes. That's not what this one means. This is a different term that says to speak well of. Paul is ready to speak well of God the Father because it's his design. He is the architect of all of it. And so when he says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing, I want you to understand this. And I just, it's, it's, it's becoming more clear to me. Not too long ago, I, I, I looked at the struggles in my life, and I thought, you know, God still needs to change my heart. He needs to do something in me to help me to become somebody that I'm not. I'm beginning to understand, no, this verse right here says, God has already changed my heart. He has made me a new creature in Christ. He has given me new desires. He's given me a new purpose. He's given me everything that I need. My problem isn't that he needs to give me something new. My problem is I need to put to death the old man. I need to put to death the old way of doing it because he's already given me everything I need in Christ. Every spiritual blessing is found in Jesus Christ. When did that take place? That's not future. That's not right now. That took place at the moment of salvation. We think about how that happens. And it says here in verse 5, or verse 4, sorry, he chose us in him before the world was created. And now why in the world did he do that? Because Tony, you're such a good looking guy. Other Tony, you got so much money. He knew this whole young crew up here would be so smart. That, that's not, it has absolutely nothing to do with us. It's to the praise of his glory. He looked through time and he didn't evaluate what we had. He saw what we didn't have. And he sent Christ to meet our need before the foundation of the world so that we should be holy and blameless. Again, to use the, the little letter earlier, we look around and I don't know about you, but I was standing at the door in the early service and we were reminded by one of the people coming in, there's no way I'm holy and blameless. And I had to ask for forgiveness. As a pastor of someone coming into the service. But you know what? My holiness isn't dependent on me. My holiness is dependent upon what Christ accomplished on the cross. And it's my desire to walk in that. One day, I'll be done with this wrestle with sin. But until then, I need to cooperate because he has chosen me to be holy and blameless before him. 
in love. He predestined us for adoption. Who adopted us? Those of you who are in the workshop, you know. Who adopted us? This God the Father. The one who runs to the prodigal and says, Welcome home. Let's get on a party. But also the father who looks at the other son who's whining and complaining because he didn't get what he thought he deserved and says as well, come on home. Let's celebrate together. He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to the purpose of his will. He didn't just adopt us into his family because it was a whim. It was his intentional purpose that he brought us in as adopted children. What's that purpose? To the praise of his glorious grace. It has nothing to do with you and nothing to do with me. It is all through Jesus. Let's look at stanza two. Stanza two transitions from God the Father to God the Son, and it says, in him, we have redemption through his blood. Redemption is the idea of deliverance into freedom. However, that deliverance into freedom was not without a cost. God doesn't just wink at our sin and say, well, Lauren's not too bad. I mean, Thane, I can't do it with his stuff, but Lauren can get in. It is every single sin needs to be dealt with. You know what the crazy thing is? He poured out his wrath upon his son so that you and I could know freedom. For the first time in all of eternity, Jesus was separated from God the Father when he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was forsaken so that you and I would never have to be if we put our trust in him. We'd never have to know that isolation from God. He redeemed us. He set us free. And he even further defines it by helping us to understand it is the forgiveness of our sin that needed to be dealt with. But how does he do that? He gives us a couple of ways that he goes about doing that. According to, number one, the riches of his glory. It's not out of his riches, but according to. Because if it was out of his riches, he would get started and he would say, Dick, I'll give you some of my riches, no problem. Dennis, I'll give you some of my riches, no problem. We get over to Jim Barry. Oh, I ran out. That's not how it works. He is giving according to his riches. How much riches does he have? It is immeasurable. And he just keeps giving and giving and giving. And there is no end to that supply. He is redeeming us and forgiving us because he's able to meet the need of every single person who says, I want to call in the name of Jesus. According to the riches as well, he says, it is according to his purpose. He has a purpose. What was that purpose? His purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, is to unite all things to himself. Again, we've talked about this before here at PCBC, but man, it looks like our world has kind of gone crazy. This is not the way it's supposed to be. Would you agree? Our world is not how God designed it. We look back in Genesis chapters 1 and 2 and we go, that sounds a little more like it. A place where I can work and I don't have to, I don't have to labor intensively for things like thistles and stuff like that. We get along with each other. We walk in the garden. We have a relationship with God. That's how it's supposed to be. You know what God's purpose is? To restore it to that. 
to help us to understand our purpose and our significance. And he did it through Christ so that he might unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth, not just things here on this earth, but the chaos that we know goes on in the spiritual realm. One day he's going to set all that right too. And he did it through Christ. It's according to his good purpose. He also made us heirs. Jesus made us heirs of all that belongs to Christ. I don't get that. I don't understand that. I'm not even going to try to explain it. Because you don't understand what Christ inherited. He has a name above every name. That doesn't mean you and I get that. But it means that in his reign, guess what? We reign. In his peace, we have peace. In his glory, we glory. His inheritance belongs as well to us. But look again, according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. He does two things, according to the purpose and according to the counsel of his will. Again, in the letter, this world does not look like that's what's happening. This world doesn't look like it's going according to God's plan. It looks like it's chaos at the moment. But what does he say? Every single thing will come under his rule, and it will be according to his plan and according to his purpose. So that, and he, I believe here he's referring individually to the Jews, and he'll talk collectively in just a second to the Gentiles, but so that those who are the first to hope in Christ, that there should be a the there, in the Christ. The Jewish people didn't know who Jesus was. They put their tr faith and their trust in the fact that God would send a Messiah. Those who are the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. Guess what? The Israelites missed out on that too. What did they think it was about? It's about us. It's about our kingdom. It's about our nation. It's about our people. No, it's not. It's to the praise of his glory. And he goes on and stands in number three. Talks about the work of the Spirit. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is a guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit were involved in this thing that we call the gospel, the good news, the rescuing that we needed. And here's the deal with God the Holy Spirit. There's one idea here, and it's that we were sealed because we believed in Christ. Because we put our eggs in that basket, the Spirit of God came and dwelled in us. We've talked about, again, this in our workshop, the, the idea of being filled with the Spirit. There's a lot of confusion out there. At the moment we trusted Christ as our Savior, the Holy Spirit came and resided in each one of us and sealed us as a promised guarantee that what you put your trust in will take place. How much of the Spirit did we get at salvation? You got all you're ever going to get. When you read about being filled with the Spirit, it's not that you need more of the Spirit. You've got the Spirit, okay? But being filled with the Spirit is my submission to what He wants me to do. It's me saying, I'm done with self, and I'm going to let Him call the shots. Just like in the illustration that we talked about in our workshop, there's just like sometimes we let alcohol control us. I'm not in control anymore. The alcohol is, and I do stuff I don't even know I'm doing. That's the idea of being filled with the Spirit. He controls us. The idea of being filled with fear, being filled with anger. That's the, it changes who we are because He's in control. Literally, the Spirit of God is the deposit guaranteeing payment for you and for me. And He lives in us. So you've got this, this hymn that Paul starts off with, or this statement of faith, 
You say, wait, Paul, that doesn't help me a whole lot. I asked you some other questions. And Paul gets to some of those things. He gets to what it looks like to have good marriages. He gets to what it looks like, parent-child relationship and at work and all that. But if we skip over this part, it just becomes a bunch of rules. And you're going to give up sooner or later because you can't do it by yourself. So Paul starts off, you need to know this. And then he says, in the next little section here, a prayer. For this reason. For what reason? The reason that Christ has done absolutely everything that you need. And because I see in you two things. Number one, I see you loving God and I see you loving others. Remember when Jesus said, hey, can you summarize the Bible for us? Yeah, I can do it in two, two statements. Love God, love your neighbors yourself. Paul says, I see that in you. And I want you to understand I am, I am consistently praying for you. He does say giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. That's kind of one thought in, in the original language. That's one verb that's going to lead us through this whole sentence. It's one sentence. That's a big, long sentence, isn't it? We're going to work our way through it again, just real quickly, just so you can understand what Paul is praying for. But he's not ceasing to pray for them for three purposes. Number one, that God would give them the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. There was so much that Paul just talked about in those first verses. Paul says, you haven't even started to understand all that Christ has done on your behalf. You have not begun to understand all that God has given you that pertains to this life and the next. I'm praying that God would help you to continue to understand that. Second thing he asks, that you would have the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you would be able to, to understand not just with your mind, but with your inner being, all that belongs to you in Christ. You know, it's one thing to know the Bible. There are a lot of students of the Bible who are not even saved. They know what it says, but their heart has not been enlightened. God has not impressed it upon them about how that information goes from head knowledge to heart knowledge. Paul's saying, I want you to understand both. And then he says, I want you to know, and he's going to list off three things. I want you to know, number one, the hope to which he has called you over and over and over. He's going to say in the book of Ephesians, walk according to your calling, walk according to your calling, walk according to your... Why does he keep bothering to repeat that over and over and over? Because there is a hope that belongs to your calling, and it's not just about there. It's about here. He has given us the power that we need to live the godly life right here on this earth. Second thing, what are the riches of the, his glorious inheritance in the saints? Now, first time I read that, and the second time, and the third time, I think I missed the point there. Whose inheritance is he referring to? What are the riches of his glorious inheritance? Um. I was hoping you'd talk a little bit more about me. Now, I want you to understand this. You are his inheritance. I don't know why. I don't know how. Because, again, I look at me, and I'm not much of inheritance. But somehow he looks at us as his riches, as the one that, Again, one day he's going to present us spotless before the throne of God, and you are his inheritance. That gets us away from the woe is me, and that gets us away from look at me to say, God, you are crazy to think that I am your inheritance. And the third thing is, what is the immeasurable greatness of his power? 
The word immeasurable there is kind of important. But what kind of greatness and power are you talking about? He lists three things. Again, he kind of likes threes here. And he says, I want you to understand this power is the same power that worked his great might in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Uh, seated him at his right hand. A little bit of power. Raising Christ from the dead and the one who was crucified and in a tomb is now sitting at the right hand of God the Father. He is not dead anymore. That's power. And it is the immeasurable power that is available to us. Give us another example, Paul. He put all things under Christ's feet. That takes a little bit of power too, doesn't it? That's a mighty power to be able to say absolutely everything in heaven and on earth is now under the feet of Jesus. But that's the power that's available to you and to me. And the last thing is he put him as head over all things. Over all things. Not just things here on the earth that we can see visible, but even the things that we can't see, the invisible. Jesus Christ is head over all. That's power. And that is available to you and to me. You see, when he says in those previous verses that God has given to us everything that we need in Christ, he didn't miss anything. He gave us everything that we need so that one day he can present us holy and blameless before God. But please don't jump to the holy and blameless without him because you can't get there. In Christ, he has given us everything that we need. This is the foundation of Paul's petition. The work of God in Christ. Before we kind of quick start summarizing things, I want you to notice something about Paul's prayer. Please hear me all the way through, okay? Paul is not praying about a broken toe. He's not praying about a, an animal that got lost, a pet that got lost. He's not praying about a parking space close to the front door. I'm not, not saying don't pray for those things, okay? Jesus said, hey, we got a father that cares about where we're at. He does care. But Paul's prayer here is not about what I want, but about what he wants. And I know in my own life, I don't pray enough about that. I pray about all the stuff I want. I pray about my comfort. I pray about my things that I want to happen in my life instead of praying about the things that I know he wants for me. Can I encourage you to think through that a little bit? And maybe think through some of the prayers that we're praying and say, God, I, I want to change my prayers so that they matter. So back to the questions that we were asked in this imaginary letter to Paul. Paul addresses those questions a little bit differently than you and I might, right? Right? We like to give six steps to this and just give a little bit of thought to that and, and maybe you should change a few things over here and you can get your life worked out. Paul doesn't start there. Not that he doesn't address that, not that he doesn't address the things that need to change, but he says, first, you need to know you have everything that you need. You have absolutely everything that you need in Christ. He's done it all. He's given you a new heart. You're a new creature. You just need to say, I'm done with the old. I'm at, by faith, I'm going to take him at his word, and I'm going to start walking according to my calling. I'm done being in charge. Rather than offering steps or keys to living, Paul offers them the truth of Christ in you, the hope of glory. The world's going to tell you that's not enough. The world is going to say, okay, I, I get that, 
but if you're really going to make it, you, you got to go see this counselor. You got to add these three steps. You got to know this one thing over here. Because if it's just Jesus, that's a little too heavenly to be any earthly good. Well, I'm here to tell you there's no such thing. This is the drama of redemption throughout all of history where God has had to step in and not just become one of us, but do for us what we could never do for ourselves. He did that in Christ. And when he did that, he did that out of the riches that he has in heaven. Where's Paul writing from? He's writing from prison. As Paul writes this, he understands, I can't just give him a quick fix. I have to give him something that's going to be of some sort of substance. And so as Paul thinks about how to answer it, he doesn't just jump into, hey, Husbands, love your wives. Wives, respect your husbands. Or fathers, don't exasperate. He says, man, if I'm going to give them things that are going to help, this is what's getting me through. But typically, we ask God and we ask others to help us change our feelings and change our circumstances, don't we? We ask God, please get me out of this. Or please, I don't like feeling like this. And we ask God to take those things away. Or we bring somebody alongside of us. And I don't like feeling. Tell me how to feel different. Tell me how to get out of this circumstance. That's not what God wants necessarily. I'm not saying he doesn't, but not necessarily. I know what he wants, though. He wants Christ-likeness in you and in me. God is in the change business, but it's not what you think. He desires to give us a new heart. He desires Christ's likeness, and that happens at the moment of salvation for those who have placed their trust in Christ. Now, it is his goal to get us to mature in Christ. Paul goes on to remind the church at Ephesus specifically what this ought to look like. He says, once you were in darkness, now you're in light. Once you were slaves to sin, now you're free. Once you lived one way, now you're living another. He goes on to be specific about it. But you can't jump straight to what we should and shouldn't do. Or this becomes just a list of rules. And you know who had perfected that? The nation of Israel. They were proud of the fact that they kept their laws and they had added to the laws and they kept everything and made sure they were doing all the right things, thinking that was impressive to God. And the book of Malachi says, God says it makes him want to throw up. Stop. Just stop bringing your junk to me. I want a relationship. I want that first. I don't want a bunch of stuff. And it has to be out of a love for all that he has done for me. Here's the crazy thing. Paul's writing to the church at Ephesus. He starts off this way and he says, I want you to understand all that you have in Christ. So that when I tell you what to do and not do, it's not so that you like look at it as a list of rules and you're proud of that but so that you love him and you want to do that jump to the book of revelation real quickly revelation chapter 2 to the angel of the church in where ephesus he writes in verse 3 i know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake and you have not grown weary but i have this against you that you have abandoned the love that you had at first. You're doing a lot of good stuff. But you forgot Ephesians chapter 1. You forgot what he did for you. 
And now you're just doing the right things because it's the way you've always done it, because this is the way we do it now, because you have to remember, therefore, from where you've fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. He, he doesn't say stop doing the works. He says, in fact, keep doing the works, but do it because you love, not because you have to. The reason he repeats, walk according to your calling, is because Paul is reminding us, live up to what has been given you in Christ. Here at PCBC, we don't want you to be just morally good people. I know it sounds like that sometimes. We're always telling you what to do and what not to do and stay away from this and make sure you do this. But please hear us. The heart behind that is that you might bring praise to the glory of God. When you're in love with God with all your heart, it's easier to love others as you ought to. It's easier to worship throughout the day. It's easier to serve others. It's easier to consistently read the word of God. Fall in love with him. There's going to be a lot of stuff going on at PCBC. We're going to start some small group counseling ministries. We're going to start some small groups. We're going to start all kinds of other things. Believe it or not, a, maybe a prayer meeting and a visitation night. Different than what it used to be. But I want you to hear this. Attendance at any of that stuff does not make you any more spiritual than not attending. You need to be at the things that will help you to grow spiritually. And if that's not going to help, don't go. In fact, sometimes we get so involved in church that we miss the priorities that God has of love God and love your neighbor because we don't have time. We're just busy taking stuff in, thinking we're doing okay. If you're here this morning because you like the show, maybe you like the pastor, maybe you like the programs, whatever it is, it's not going to be fun for you because we're not going to be content with just having people here. That's not why we're here. We are here to see people grow in Christ. We're going to ask you to get involved in something smaller than Sunday. We're going to ask you to serve, to spend time in the Word, to pray, to deal honestly with your sin, to celebrate with others when God's at work. Those things aren't necessarily fun, but they're critical to mature worshipers because He has given us so much. This isn't about growing PCBC to a number. This is about helping people to grow in Christ. It is about Lives being to the praise of his glory. If you're here this morning and you're new, and all the stuff that we just talked about is new to you, and you've not heard it, I want you to understand everything that we've talked about today, God did for you personally. It's not enough to believe that Jesus was a good person. The demons believe that. And they have no relationship with God. It's not enough to go to church. It's not enough to do a lot of good things. Scripture says we are dead in our sin. That means separated from God. There's nothing we can do to fix that problem. But as we just read, Jesus took our place. He was separated from God. He was punished for all that you and I did in order that we wouldn't have to be punished, in order that we wouldn't have to be separated from God. He paid the penalty for what we've done in offending a holy God, no matter how big or how small. He overcame, though, sin and death through his resurrection. He's not in that grave anymore. And because of that, he offers us a new life. He offers us an ability to be able to change the direction that we're headed, not because of us, but because of what Jesus did on the cross. And because he is alive and seated at the right hand of God, he wants to offer you a new life, not just in heaven, but here on this earth. It begins and lasts for all of eternity. He gives us a motivation and a purpose for living that's bigger than just me. 
This is a story about him. He offers hope. He offers power. He offers everything that we need that transcends what the world is offering through a career, through politics, through pleasure, whatever it is that they offer you. Nothing in this world compares to what Christ accomplished for those who put all of their eggs in this one basket in Jesus. I want to be clear as well, though, about what he doesn't offer us. He doesn't offer us a fun life. He doesn't offer us a comfortable life. He doesn't offer us a wealthy life. But he offers to do life with us. My son, when he went to, uh, I think he still goes every once in a while. He's in med school studying hard, so he doesn't have as much time. But when he went to the gym, he used to wear this shirt all the time that said this. It said, no Jesus, no life. No Jesus, no life. Jesus offers to you today, if you've never placed your faith and your trust in him, a life that is beyond compare. When we just kind of scratch the surface today, going through Ephesians chapter 1, and if you want to continue to study it, there's some uh, sermon supplements, you can keep reading about it, but I want you to understand that this offer is to you personally today. From the King of kings and the Lord of lords, I offer you life. What do you need to do? You need to pray right where you're at. Say, God, I I recognize I'm a sinner. I recognize I've offended you. I deserve punishment for that. But I thank you that Jesus took my place on the cross, that he stood in my place as God poured out his wrath upon Jesus. And I want to accept that as my own so that I can be set free to live the life that God designed for me. You do that right where you're at. I'd love to hear from you. If you have, come see me. If you want to just fill out the Connect card as well, we want to be able to help you because sometimes it's like, okay, well, I prayed that prayer, now what? We'd love to be able to help you to understand how what we just talked about is now going to help you in the days ahead. He doesn't just leave us on our own to figure it out. He gave us his word, and we want to help you in that. So come see me or fill out a Connect card, but we'd love to know that you put your trust in him. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says, Without faith, it's impossible to please God. But that also means just the opposite. With faith, guess what? You are pleasing God. When you put your faith and your trust in him, you can know that God is happy with that. And Romans chapter 10 tells us that if we put our trust in him and we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The end of that scripture says, everyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. You'll never regret it. You might have some questions along the way. I got some questions along the way. I don't know how this thing all works. But I do know that at the end of the day, when this life is over, I will never regret that I put my trust in Christ. That's his promise to you as well. For the rest of us, I want you to understand it is our desire here at PCBC that every single one of us learn how to live our lives to the glory of God. So that you too can say your life is to the praise of his glory. This isn't about you. This isn't about me. This isn't about PCBC, this is about him. Again, if you would like to do a little bit more studying and thinking through this, there's a sermon supplement back on the table back there as well. It's online. You can grab it online. Think through it yourself. Maybe grab a friend. Think through it. Talk through it. We'd love to help you to know how to do that in the days ahead. Um, If we can help you in that journey, again, just fill out the Connect card. Let us know how we can help. We'd love to be able to do that. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for Christ. I do pray, as Paul prayed, that you would help us to grasp just a little bit more each day. 
we're never going to get all that Christ has done on our behalf. But God, we want to keep applying it to our lives. We want to help us. We want to live our lives to the praise of your glory. And you've purposed that for our lives. Help us to walk in it. Help us to put to death the old man, to be finished with it, to quit giving in to our own desires and our lusts and to say, God, I'm doing it your way. So that at the end of the day, our lives would reflect what a great gift Christ was to us. Thank you for the opportunity even to go back over some basic things this morning. And may it be to your praise for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for coming this morning. God bless you as you head out into the sunshine one last week. Have fun.